Here we go. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. If you watch my show regularly, you'll know that last month I had on the McDougals, and instead of giving the presentation that they had planned, I surprised Dr. McDougal with a birthday tribute, which if you haven't seen, I'll link to below, and I really recommend it. You'll see all the who's who's, all the plant-based superstars like Dr. Dean Ornish and Dr. Colin Campbell playing tribute to Dr. McDougal. But what happened, as wonderful as that celebration was, he never got to give his presentation. So he's agreed to come back with his wonderful wife, Mary, to talk about vegan nutrition in children. What better way to start the week than Monday with the McDougals? Please welcome back Dr. John and Mary McDougal. So nice to see you again. Well, thank you, AJ. Yeah. It's always nice to be with friends. But maybe today I'll get some contesting. That would be fun. How about contesting with me a little bit? <laughs> you've, never be... back, you've never backed off, Dr. McDougall. I remember you always said I'd rather be hated than ignored. You know, truthfully, and the evidence supports my opinion as a majority opinion. In other words, the vast majority of the scientific literature says that what I'm telling you is true. You know, there are all kinds of minority opinions that come up and, you know, they're tested with time and on a few patients and so on, and most of them disappear. But, uh, you know, the truth I've been teaching has been around for thousands of years. And that is very simple, that there is a diet for people, and that's a diet based around common starches like rice and corn and potatoes and sweet potatoes and beans, peas and lentils with some fruits and vegetables. I mean, that, that's what I've been teaching. And I've been teaching, mm -hmm. I've been teaching a that you should be a, a very good consumer when it comes to medical care, because too often what you recommended has a financial incentive behind it rather than the outcome of you and your family. So I've tried to make, uh, I've tried to make careful consumers out of people. And I have to say the, uh, the most, well, almost anything. I mean, almost, should I tell them a per, personal story? Would you mind if I tell them? Uh, it all depends on what kind of a personal story it is. Well, it was like, well, before, Craig, <laughs> uh, before Craig's story. Uh, before Craig's story? After, after Patrick's story. Oh yeah, sure. It's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, All right. Okay. All right. This is real personal, AJ. And, and I, I wouldn't tell except that I knew there was a very, uh, very important audience out here. Uh, we changed our diet back in 1977, pretty much vegan by 1977. And uh, <clears throat> we'd had our first two children, Heather and Patrick at that time. And then we moved to Kailua, uh, where I went back into residency training. And uh, Mary became pregnant again, and we'd been vegan and so on. And, you know, I never really said anything about what she should eat or shouldn't eat. And, you know, I, I certainly didn't put any pressure on her. And uh, what I noticed was, you know, all of a sudden some, quote, protein was coming back into the house. And you know what I mean by that and things that we hadn't eaten in a long time. But, you know, I figured that, you know, psychologically, at least, even though I knew it wasn't true, psychologically, at least, uh, she'd feel more comfortable, you know, going with the you know, with the crowd. I mean, everybody says Dr. McDougall's wrong and I'm pregnant now and good grief. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to take an error on going with my husband. No, nah, that she didn't think that, I don't think. But anyways, her, her natural instincts came back in. Well, unfortunately, uh, she had a miscarriage and it was a very painful experience for us. But uh, <clears throat> that we passed, we passed by and uh, and pretty soon she became pregnant again. And this is with our son, Craig, who's the medical doctor here at OHSU. And uh, I, I didn't say anything about the foods that were brought into the house. And I figured, well, here we go again. But we didn't go again. This time, Mary ate very, very, very strictly, no animal foods at all. And she had a very successful pregnancy. And that was enough to, I think, convince her that you know, those experiences and those experiences, they set very heavily on people. And I understand you know, why you react the way you do. And hopefully science will take and sort things out so we can tell the truth. And the truth is the healthiest diet there is for a pregnant woman and her offspring is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables and no animal foods at all, contrary to what you and I have been taught. And you and I have been taught, I know I heard this from my mother and dad, I almost died because of it, had a stroke because of it. Uh, we've been taught that there are two important nutrients and those are calcium and protein. And I've given lectures. In fact, the first lectures I've given here have been on protein. And I gave you a counter lecture on potatoes. I've got a lecture on calcium, if you bear with me coming up here in a, a month or so that I'd like to give to your group. But it's not true. I mean, if you believe those are the most important nutrients and you live on a diet 
that is highly contaminated, fiber deficient, causes all kinds of problems. I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. But uh, anyway, so we had to learn ourselves uh, by going through some experiences. And I dare say, you know, when Heather became pregnant or any of our other uh, in-laws became pregnant, uh, they didn't change their diet. Well, they, well, you know what I do remember though from, from when Heather got pregnant the first time uh -huh. with Jason, she, would, she read all this stuff and she thought she needed more protein. Yeah. And so we found all these recipes with lentils and tofu in them. And we started out that way by making these uh, lentil and tofu casseroles. And, and then she decided, oh, heck, it's not worth it. <laughs> anyway, uh, I know the misinformation. The other interesting story, uh, when we first became vegan, it was back in about 1974. It was 74, because that's when we had Heather. She was born in 74, yes? Yeah. OK. Anyway, we were in a childbirth education class. <laughs> And that's where we got some of our more intense exposure about vegan eating. It was from uh, Buzz and Susan Hughes. And they were friends of ours. They were in the childbirth education class with us. And we had them over for, uh, <clears throat> for dinner one night. And uh, Susan was pregnant. Of course, we were in a childbirth education class together. And uh, I was concerned as her doctor. I was concerned that she wasn't getting enough protein and that she was going to end up with this little glob of a fetus. You know, that's, of course, what you're led to think. And anyway, she said, OK, I, I, I will eat some animal food, but only if you catch it. If you go spear fishing and you shoot the fish for yourself, and I know it's clean. So I did. I went out and I jumped on the cliffs on the, on the woodward side of uh, the big island and shot a few fish. I'm not proud of it these days, but that's what I did back then. And uh, I don't know whether she ate the fish or not, but uh, I think she did. I think she did. A few bites. Did. Anyway, that was you, you got to see how naive we were, how brainwashed we were, how you know it's it just uh, it happens to everybody. But hopefully, you get a little bit of the truth that comes out, and you see that it is true because you try it and it works. Anyway, the consequence of not eating right are uh, serious detriments to the baby and to the mother. Uh, first of all, the mother gets too fat because she's eating high fat, high calorie, low fiber, low calorie density foods that don't satisfy the appetite. And so she naturally gets hungry. And after all, she's growing a baby. It costs 80,000 calories to grow a baby. Only two pounds of protein, but 80,000 calories. So she's got to get this extra food, these extra nutrients, quote, more protein, vitamins, minerals, et cetera, to grow this little fetus. And so she eats more. Well, if she's confronted with the food that isn't fit for human beings, which is the Western diet, which makes people who are not pregnant and males obese and fat too, overweight too. Right? What do you think was going to happen to this poor woman? I, re I remember when I was pregnant with Craig, yeah. I only gained 15 pounds and I ate all the time. I mean, my car was littered with rice cakes and it was a mess because I just, you know, you know, messy rice cakes are to eat. They just fall apart. And my car was littered with them because I had bags full of them in, in my car. When so whenever I was hungry, I could eat rice cakes. And um, I mean, I ate other things besides rice cakes, but I didn't carry them around in my car with me. And uh, when I left the hospital, I weighed less than before I got pregnant. <laughs> incredible you know seven pounds for the baby or six something for the baby and and another six pounds for the products of conception or the placenta etc so yeah she was a trim body weight uh, and and all subsequent to pregnancy she of course Mary breastfed and that meant she got to eat a lot of food and she loved eating <laughs> as much food as I ate and I was very active windsurfing at that time so I ate a lot of food myself but uh, you know these were good pregnancies to say the least but if you don't have that advantage, you know, you're struck, stuck with the fact that you're going to get overweight, 60, 80, 100 pound weight gain is not unusual for women. Yeah, I didn't say that to, um, you know, encourage people to restrict their calories so they only gain a few pounds. I, re I said that because if you only eat the kind of food that we recommend, that's how much weight you'll gain when you're pregnant. Yeah, remember uh, most of human history uh, 
involves women who worked in the fields and stopped for 45 minutes to deliver their baby and threw their baby in the backpack and continued to pick in the fields. You know, uh, it's a normal natural time in life. It shouldn't be a sickness, but it is a sickness in our society that everybody pays for. And it's a consequence of the food. It's simply a matter of eating the wrong food. You can't grow a healthy mother and you can't grow a healthy baby. Anyway, what happens is the mothers get too, too big, too fat, overweight, et cetera, whatever you want to call it. That's politically correct these days. And so do the babies. Uh, the babies get too fat. Uh, they end up being 8, 10, 12, sometimes 14 pounds. And the mother's birth canal, you know, where the babies delivered the natural vagina, the birth canal, you know, passing through the uterus. The birth canal was designed for a five, six, maybe a seven pound baby. You can't stuff an eight, 10, 12, 14 pound baby through a canal made for a six, seven, eight pound baby. They just don't fit. And so as a result, 30% uh, of women have their babies taken out through the top. That means a cesarean section. And in, uh, in uh, very wealthy communities in Brazil, it's as high as 77%. Oh, they schedule them there. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have and the consequence is serious uh, for the baby and the mother. Uh, you have more, more loss of babies uh, that end up with overweight mothers who are delivered by C-section. And, you know, more loss of mothers. Uh, this is, a, you know, a serious consequence and it's all well documented. So anyway, uh, you deliver this baby into this sterile environment. The baby does not get the natural inoculation that it would if it passed by the, by the mother's anus where they pick up normal floral bacteria. Anyway, this, this, this poor baby gets a bad start in life by coming out of the cesarean section, but they survive, they're tough. And then of course, a bottle stuffed in their mouths too often. You know better than that. You would never dare feed a baby a bottle unless you had to. So anyway, that's, that's unfortunately the pregnancy thing. You should not be taking vitamins except for B12. And you should be eating a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. You don't have to have any extra soy you don't have to have any extra beans, peas, or lentils for the protein. You don't have to eat extra spinach for the calcium. You don't have to eat extra anything. And the proof of that is, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe a lot of billions of people, certainly, certainly a lot of billions of people who walked <laughs> this earth did not have a refrigerator to put a cow in or a mastodon. They did not have an animal oh, to milk. Prenatal vitamins. Did not have prenatal vitamins. Didn't have cesarean <laughs> sections. And by the way, the cesarean sections are needed in about 7% of the pregnancies, not 30% or 70%, but about 7%. So, you know, modern, modern, modern medicine has some wonderful things to offer. Most of the time, interference in a normal pregnancy results in a detriment to the baby and the mother. So, of course, I encourage home birth uh, by well-trained uh, uh, people who are, you know, attend births. A midwife and a doula. Thank you. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're usually women, bad, but they don't have to be. I suppose there no, have been some men that are yeah. out there and there. Anyway, what a, what a rewarding occupation that is. Unfortunately, you got to fight with the doctors and the dietitians. So I feel sorry for you. The mothers and the families and the dietitians, the doc. I feel sorry for everybody who lives in ignorance. Anyway, so you have this, uh, this baby born and the baby is bottle fed too often doesn't have to be. Normal natural uh, behavior in a society would be that women would naturally feed their own babies, their own offspring. But in those times when a woman couldn't say she was injured or had some kind of infection or for one reason or another, she could not tend her offspring, what the mother would do is hand off the baby to a sister or a good friend. And that was normal and natural. And in every society that I've ever had any contact with or read about, in our society, unfortunately, such behavior is, uh, is synonymous in some people's minds with pornography. You know, what, what is uh, uh, damaging to children and women and everybody in society is to make their children sick because they're bottle fed. And bottle fed babies do poorly. They have, uh, they have about four times the risk of crib death they have a uh, increased risk of pneumococcal pneumonia by 60 fold the first three months of life. 60 times the risk of getting pneumococcal pneumonia the first three months of life. 
in a bottle-fed baby. Uh, lower IQs, uh, speech problems, increased risk of uh, cancers and infections when they're little babies. And also, as an adult, you have an increased risk of heart attacks, ulcerative colitis, obesity, diabetes, et cetera, if you happen to be a bottle-fed baby. And that's probably because bottle-fed families eat rich foods and not because you got a bad start in life. Let's hope not. <laughs> anyway, they, they just, you know, to continue out the kids uh, about, oh, you know, you get statistics as high as 30% of the kids are obese. You know, certainly when I went to school, if you had an obese child in every other grade, she or he, usually a she, really stood out. At least that in my mind, it was mostly a little girl that suffered. But now it's the norm. And these kids are constipated. They have headaches. They have indigestion. They have atherosclerosis developing in their arteries. As of eight months of age, a bottle-fed baby can have atherosclerosis. And by two years of age, 100% of the children studied in New Orleans. Back a few years, a few years ago. It's worse now, I'm sure. By two years of age, 100% of children on the Western diet showed evidence of artery damage from the food. And by, by age uh, 22, 70% of the men who were shot and killed in the Korean War had significant atherosclerosis. In the Vietnamese conflict, it was 50% of the soldiers had significant atherosclerosis. This is a, a motorcycle accidents, auto accidents done on children show a very high rate of damage to their arteries. Or you remember, I'm sure those of you who remember my history well, is I had a massive stroke when I was 18. You know, why not? And that wasn't from clean arteries. <laughs> no, was, in fact, they did an angiogram on me <clears throat> right through my neck. It's the way they used to do them is in the neck. I remember waking up in the morning, my, my chin touched my chest because of the blood from the angiogram. Anyway, they uh, showed that I had a, I had what we call a lacunar infarct which is a plaque ruptured in my brain. Anyway, it caused me to be a doctor. The reason <laughs> I'm sitting here now is because of that. So anyway, the children are, the children are sick. They don't really care because they don't see the inside of the arteries. They don't see the breast cancer that's starting maybe as young as a teenager. Uh, they don't care about the diabetes. It really doesn't matter to them as long as they're able to do the things that kids do these days. Except there are some things that they're concerned about, uh, like for example, their personal parents. Uh, kids do not want to be discriminated against. They do not want to be ridiculed. And their personal parents and their performance are two areas where they can be easily ridiculed. And so if you find your child has greasy skin or acne or greasy hair or is too overweight and being teased or can't perform on the athletic field, can't run, no endurance, or suffers from aches and pains and is not getting the most of this child shut out of life, fix them. The problem's the food. Get rid of their acne. Matter of a month, or their acne will be gone. Get rid of their constipation overnight. You know, get them performing athletic wise in a matter of just a few days. So the, the potentials are huge. So you talk about kids about ridicule as they get to be older kids, they're concerned about beauty and power. We can get into that later. That's where we talk about adults. Anything you wanted to add about kids, Mary? You had, it was nice having healthy kids. Yeah, we never really had to worry about it. I mean, our kids never went to the doctor. Well, obviously not because you were there. I was there to sew them up. <laughs> <laughs> but they never had any problems. We were very fortunate. The kids were, mm -hmm. were and I know it's at least in part because, because of the way they were fed, the kind of mothering that they got. And the fact that I'm very conservative, I would not run my kids off to see the doctor for every little sniffle. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, uh, well, actually, a couple of people watching live asked uh, if Heather had home births, but Heather is watching live and she's been answering that in the chat. So she said that she had the first one in the hospital and would never do that again. And the next two were home births. I'm curious, Mary, it's so interesting to me that you came out of the hospital slimmer. You know, you see these women that are gaining like 50, 60 pounds and you wonder, but the baby only weighs eight. How, where, where, <laughs> where, does, the rest of the, where does the rest of the weight come from? Right. And it's not often easily taken off by women that are gaining no, that during their no. pregnancy. It's, it's so refreshing to hear that it's possible to have a healthy pregnancy and, and really not gain any weight other than the weight of the baby. And, and of course, I wasn't starving myself. I was eating 
the same kind of foods that we eat all the time. I just ate a lot of it because I was hungry all the time. And she didn't develop uh, morning sickness. Uh, in fact, there's an article, and this oh, is in no. my, my no. January 2011 newsletter on pregnancy. And there's a real interesting article about how uh, morning sickness is a natural intended occurrence for a woman to lose her appetite so that she can avoid the poisons in the environment. And it occurs with most uh, aversion towards animal foods. You know, when women have morning sickness, they're able to tolerate fruits and vegetables and starches and so on. But it's mostly animal foods that they're adverse to for a reason, that these are poisonous. And what we find is that women who have morning sickness actually have better outcomes fewer birth defects, less difficulties with their pregnancy. And that may be because during a very sensitive time in their pregnancy, they got too sick to eat the American diet. So at least take, took some of the, uh, the toxic burden off of their system. You know, you always wonder there's certain things that pregnant women are, are advised to avoid, like seafood, like alcohol. And yet once the pregnancy is over, they go right back to those things. <laughs> There, there was an, uh, an article in the New York Times in the year 2008, and what they did is they went around to restaurants and uh, groceries uh, throughout New York City, and they found that uh, as few as six pieces of sushi exceeded the EPA and the FDA, what are considered safe levels to consume. Six pieces of sushi, that's it. So yeah, you've got to, it's, it's methylmercury that people are more concerned about than anything else. You can tell how much seafood a person eats by the level of methylmercury in their body fat, because almost all of the methylmercury, which is a serious neurotoxin, you know, resulted in dementia, you know, all, all kinds of, 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 of mental problems uh, is due to methylmercury. We've known that for years, um, it's well established. It's uh, seafood that gives you the methylmercury. Stop eating the fish. <laughs> it, the idea that you need fish to develop a nervous system that's normal and healthy is completely silly. In fact, in the next talk I give on fats, which I'll, I'll, I would like if, if uh, AJ will have me, I'll give you a talk on fats I'm putting together right now. Oh, and how silly it is, the idea that you have to eat fish to have a normal brain in your child or a normal pregnancy or a normal brain development when you know, a good share of the world's population has been raised in terrestrial environments with no marine life around at all. And they've had normal, healthy babies. They've fought wars. They've run athletic events. Obviously, you can get enough of the essential fats, which, by the way, are made by plants and only plants. Yeah. Just want to say, Jeanette says, this man is a national treasure, just so you know, and people are saying they love the idea of a weekly feature Monday with the McDougals. You know, Dr. McDougal, one of the things is so many women have a difficult time getting pregnant now and being overweight or obese. Doesn't that contribute to some infertility in some people? Definitely. Obesity is associated with infertility because you have hormone imbalances that have been created by carrying all that body fat around. And uh, what's shown is women who eat a plant-based diet have twice the, the, the fertility, are able to get pregnant uh, twice as easily or twice as often. And uh, so a plant-based diet will determine your fertility. Uh, folic acid has been a big deal talked about with women in pregnancy because folic acid deficiency, folic, folic, folate, foliage, plants, get it. <laughs> Folic acid deficiency has been a big deal over the last uh, 30 plus years since it's been discovered to be associated with defects in the nervous system, like anencephaly, where the baby is born without any brain. Mary, I was on two deliveries where the mothers delivered babies with no brains. It was such a traumatic event. Huh. There are lots of deliveries I've seen in taking care of the children after the deliveries where they've got spina bifida where their nervous system is exposed. Oh, what a tragedy. They can't urinate, their lower extremities don't work. It's just a horrible thing. And uh, this, this neuro tube defect problem has been caused by folic acid deficiency. And what women have been told to do is to take folic acid during their reproductive years. You've got to take it before you get pregnant for it to work. So they tell women to take it throughout their whole life. Well, doesn't that sound kind of silly? that you have to take a pill your whole life 
to have a normal pregnancy or reduce the risk of this serious neural tube defect was because folic acid is from plants and people don't eat enough plants in their diet. And when you recommend the folic acid doses that are recommended to pre prevent defects in the nervous system, these are levels that have been shown to, to have an increased risk of heart disease and cancer in adults. It just doesn't seem fair, does it? No, well, it's not fair for a very important reason, and that is that it's not right and it's solved by correcting the problem. And when you correct the problem, you don't have to eat all the pesticide loaded foods either. I mean, it's just an easy fix. So anyway, this folic acid deficiency in women is well known. Uh, anybody who's a pregnancy age or years, you've been told to take a supplement. I'm telling you, eat plant foods, plant food based diet. And uh, it affects men too. Uh, folic acid levels in a man are associated with defects of, uh, uh, of, of their genetic materials called trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. And a man has twice the risk of uh, having an offspring with Down syndrome if he has low folic acid levels in his body. So, you know, it just men, women, the whole produ reproductive scheme is tied to you being a healthy person so that you can have a healthy offspring. And I mean, what, what, what parent who had a birth defect in a child or, or, or Down syndrome or just a child not doing as well in school as if she or she could have, would you put that burden on your kid or eating a hot dog or drinking a glass of milk or eating cheese? Well, you're doing it. They don't know. No, they don't know. They're like my no. parents. They were taught that calcium and protein yeah. are the most important nutrients lies but sells product again it's not a conspiracy it's just business ladies and gentlemen don't take it personal if your child has a cleft lip or a heart a hole in his heart you know it's not nothing personal just that's what we had to do to grow our cows to grow our cow's milk to put in enough pesticides in our way well, you know how the scheme goes it's loaded with chemicals that cause these defects Would you say it would be good for a woman to get a hold of her health before even trying to get pregnant, maybe taking your program so that she could get in a more normal weight before even trying to conceive? Because when I've interviewed plant-based or even not plant-based OBGYNs, they say that when a mother is overweight or obese, it's just, it's much, much more complicated of a delivery often. Oh yeah, yeah, more complicated. And uh, if, if she loses weight, she runs into another problem. And that is that she has all of this, uh, this chemical load stored in her body fat. And for this chemical to get out of the body, which is detoxified by the liver, it has to go into the bloodstream. So it comes out of the body fat into the bloodstream, gives you high levels of these environmental chemicals throughout your body, including your developing fetus. And so, yeah, if you're gonna get pregnant, uh, you really need to start with a healthy body. You need to lose all that chemical chemical laden fat that you got as a consequence feeding meat and dairy and fish and eggs and so on. And you need to clean that body out and then you need to restore some of that body fat with clean healthy fat, which would be from preferably organic uh, starches, vegetables and fruits. And then you have the best chance of having a healthy offspring. It's babies are supposed to be beautiful. They're supposed to be normal. They're supposed to be perfect. An article about how it's, that you were going to refute about how they were saying it's not healthy to raise children on a vegan diet. Right. Well, I don't exactly remember that article, AJ. Any specific points, I kind of addressed them all. Uh, oh, I, I, they may have said that children will be smaller. That was, that was the reason I said, it was about a month ago I sent you the article. And uh, they, they complain about children being smaller uh, when they eat a vegan diet, that must have been it. And that argument is somewhat true. Somewhat true. It could be true, but it may well, not we be. We haven't found it to be true in our family. No, our kids are, <laughs> Heather's taller than Mary. Uh, both Craig and Patrick are taller than I am. I'm taller than my father. And the boys are all taller than you. They're all, now the, the grand, oh. we have the grandkids with us right now. And these aren't even the oldest grandkids. No. Boy, and the oldest one is even taller than these two. Yeah. Forget this tall stuff. Uh, <laughs> what it has to do with is how many calories are fed to the child during the child's adolescence, how tall they get. And uh, during my dad's time, and say some of the times we're going to talk about in a minute, the amount of food available was less. 
And uh, if you only have enough food available, you don't have what you can observe in history. And that is that uh, people used to be smaller. For example, you went to a European castle and you saw the armor of a man back in the olden times. And you go, my goodness, this guy's only about this tall. Well, that's how tall guys were. They were about this tall, you know, the five, 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 eight, big person. Uh, same thing with women, they were small too. George Washington's bed, I remember when I yeah, went I to see that. I was say that. It was just a little tiny bed, you know? The people used to be smaller. And uh, I would argue that we are uh, too big. And <laughs> too big, the taller you are, the more risk of colon cancer, the more risk of heart disease, the earlier you are likely to die. In other words, the, long, the, the less long you will likely live, the more likely you are to get cancer of many, of many kinds, the taller you are. Why? Because taller people reflect an exaggeration of nutrition. Well, that's okay. only if they eat the wrong things. Well, if they, have, they only eat the wrong things, right. But they do. Most of them do. Not yeah, like our kids. I mean, yeah, like our kids are tall, but they didn't. They didn't get that. No, they way got tall eating. eating good foods. Thanks they for bringing that out. That's important. Yeah, you know. So if you feed them good things to encourage growth, and there's enough calories, and of course, Mary, make sure plenty of food is available for our kids, then they grow big too. So if you want big kids, but anyway, bigness, not just fatness, but tallness, is associated with worse health, health outcomes. By the way, I've noticed that I have to buy about five times as much food as I used to buy for John and I, because I have the two, oh, two of the older grandkids here and they eat all the time. We're going to the grocery store every other day at least. <laughs> so. That's fantastic. Uh, Dr. McDougall, there's a couple questions like people are asking, do you think that so many babies have colic is because of cow's milk? Yes, uh, uh, there was a study done by Jacobson. You'll find it in the McDougall plan book. And it was a study of uh, it was a t study to test the idea that breastfed babies don't get colic. Okay, and so Jacobson was a woman. She decided that what she was going to do was to uh, it was to study women who were breastfeeding, and uh, what she found was that women who were breastfeeding, what they were doing to cause the colic in the babies that they themselves were consuming cow's milk. They found the cow's milk in her breast milk, and they found the cow's milk in the baby's blood. And they associated with the number of colicky attacks. And then they took the women off the, women off the cow's milk who were breastfeeding, and they saw that their milk cleared up from the cow milk protein. The baby's gut didn't have the cow milk protein, you did the blood, baby's bloodstream, and they counted the number of colic episodes and it dramatically reduced. So the truth is, Breastfed babies who are breastfed by mothers who eat a clean diet don't have colic or much less colic. I, don't know, I, I can't imagine those not being difficult times in everybody's life when a new baby is introduced. <laughs> so, uh, but but the, the, the constant screaming, the constant pain the child appears to be in, they are. And yeah, I know you didn't feed them any cow's milk, but you just had a, you know, a great big bowl of ice cream or a cheese sandwich. Where do you think that, that cow milk protein goes? And it makes the baby sick. Anyway, you can find that article in, uh, it's published in The Lancet, 1972, I think. But anyway, Jacobson's the name. <laughs> it's in the McDougall Plan book in the section on dairy. People are asking, is it okay to give a toddler almond milk? I would think so. Uh, the, the, the problem is, AJ, is you know, I don't know what's in these various almond and soy milks that are out there. And I think they can be used as a, um, you know, but, as a beverage. But not as a formula. Not as a formula, no. Because I don't, I don't know what they have in them. I don't know whether they're adequate or whatever they, because they, they haven't been developed for that purpose. They've developed for ch older children and adults to put on their cereal or in their cooking to make uh, a replacement for milk, cow's milk. But when it comes to formula, that's a whole other different thing. And maybe I can address that for a minute. Is, uh, you know, we've been very successful for having breastfeeding mothers in our family, but not, not solely. We had a situation where one of the family members could not breastfeed. And so uh, I was caught with the dilemma of having another grandson and not being able to feed them by method of choice. It really was, it was by method, I didn't have a choice. 
So uh, I had to figure out what kind of uh, substitute feeding this child would get. And I first thought about a surrogate mother and kind of looked around for that and that didn't work out. And then I thought about uh, banked breast milk. And I quickly dismissed that. And I'll tell you why in a second. And I ended up finally by making up our own formula. And I'll tell you about that. But the reason I, I rejected the, uh, the banked milk, which is where mothers, good hearted mothers for a fee, I think they might make money for doing this. Yeah. They donate their breast milk and then it's fed to, to babies who need this kind of uh, milk at that particular maturity in, in the development. But the problem is, is that the milk is all dirty. Now it used to be dirty with infectious agents and hopefully they've cleared most of those up like hepatitis, bad cow, prion, et cetera. I mean, hopefully they've cleared out all that up, but there's a whole nother level of, of contamination that they haven't looked for and will not look for. They found that they'd be horrified. And that is the contamination of breast milk with environmental chemicals. A woman dumps half of her pesticide load into her breast milk the first six months of breastfeeding. This is a horrendous assault on the, on the infant. So that's why I wouldn't feed uh, bank formula to this baby. And uh, what my decision was, and I did a lot of research on this, was to pick hypoallergenic, hypoallergenic, or it's all called denatured cow's milk protein which you can buy legally in the United States. You can't buy it in New Zealand legally, but you can buy it in the United States. And what this is, is they take the cow milk formula and they break up the proteins so they're not allergic. So they don't cause the type one diabetes and the other allergic reactions. So they break up the proteins and then they put these denatured proteins back into the formula. Why did I pick that? Well, because I felt that that was less toxic than soy formula. Why soy formula has huge amounts of aluminum in it due to the processing. Soy formula may have some estrogenic problems with it. Yeah, uh, and I don't recommend soy, soy foods or soy sources of protein for pregnant women either. In Britain, where women eat an awful lot of soy products, they found that the male babies had an increased risk of a congenital urinary defect called hypospadia, which occurred one other time in my medical history. And this is when women were taking estrogens to prevent loss of pregnancy. It used to be that doctors would, would take a pregnant woman who was threatening miscarriage and put her on female hormones, estrogens. Well, they found that there has a high rate of female cancer, vaginal cancer, and a high rate of hypospadia from doing this. And so what this journal, British Journal of Urology reported was that in British women who happen to eat a high amount of soy, which happens to have an estrogenic effect, they have a higher rate of hypospadia in their male offspring compared to the general population. Of course, the title of the article and the takeaway for most consumers is don't feed a vegan diet when you're pregnant because you'll have more of this, uh, this hypospadia thing. Well, that's not the message. The message is not to feed a diet high in soy to the pregnant mother. And that carries on to the baby. It's high soy levels, enough to cause hormone changes in a woman. If you feed women, menstruating women, a, a glass of soy a day, you'll find that you'll decrease their amount of menstrual flow when they have a period. You'll shorten the days between periods, say between 28 days between bleeding versus 26 days, just by adding soy milk to the ba to the mother's di the, the the fertile woman's diet. I've said enough. <laughs> Dr. McDougall, you talk a lot about protein. You've given several lectures about it, and people are obsessed with not getting enough protein in this country, in this culture. And that's why they say, well, they can't be vegan or plant-based, but breast milk has very little protein, doesn't it? Right, breast milk, 5% of the calories are protein, 5%. And sweet potatoes are 6%, rice is uh, 8%, potatoes are 10%, oatmeal 16%, beans, peas, and lentils are 26% protein. So a time in life when you're growing your maximum rate you double in size in the first three to six months of life. Your ideal fuel 
only contains 5% of the calories as protein. At a time in your life when you're not supposed to be doubling in size, you know, you're an adult, but you may be doubling in size. You're eating a, 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 a source of food that has so much higher in protein and the wrong kinds of protein. Animal proteins are so much more destructive, so much harder on the body than plant proteins. But you can't feed sweet potato mashed up sweet potatoes to babies as formula because there's other yeah. stuff in formula that, that's important. That's right, it. we re must rely upon the drug companies to put everything in to cause the kids to stay alive, but barely. <laughs> <laughs> they do, they stay alive. I, I don't know, you know, it's a good question you have whether there are, remember the studies in Peru where they fed uh, uh, the kids all potatoes yeah. from eight months of age yeah. and on. Yeah. So uh, normal growth, normal development uh, from eight months of age on, they put the kids on a diet that uh, all the protein came from potatoes. This was a study of orphan children in Peru. It's cited in the Stark Solution book. It's cited also in, uh, in the article on protein that I wrote about in the newsletter, which you find by looking up hot topics and a uh, article called When Friends Ask, Where Do I Get My Protein? It's in there. Nice. You know, so thank you for giving options for women that can't breastfeed. It, breastfeed is really important too, isn't it? For the jaw of the baby. Isn't that why so many babies need or, or children need orthodontia later because they never developed the, that thing. That's what I heard. I don't well, know. you know, uh, th that, that may be true. Suckling may be important to the development of the jaw. It certainly makes sense. Uh, Western Potter. Some of you have heard about the Western Potter Foundation. Uh, the Western Potter Foundation, it's a, a group of uh, people who now recommend a, a high protein diet. Oh, excuse me, Western Price Foundation, Price Western Foundation. Uh, anyway, they, they recommend a, um, a high protein, high animal food diet based on the work of Price and Weston, but primarily Price Potter. Potter Price, Price Potter. Anyway, Price, Western. Western Price. Western Price. Thank you, Western Price. Anyway, all those names go together. <laughs> and you question whether I remember the rest of the story, right? Uh, what happened was uh, they went around the world and they found that uh, populations of people who didn't eat the Western diet had no problems with orientation of the teeth. They had no malalignment of the teeth. And then what they found is that when they went back and studied these same populations of people after the Western diet was introduced, that not only did they have tooth decay, but they also had malalignment of the teeth. And so their idea was that the Western diet, and of course, breastfeeding or not breastfeeding could be part of this, uh, whether or not the Western diet uh, caused uh, these you know, abnormal teeth alignments because of or development of the jaw and the teeth. It's a very sensitive part of the neurologic development. So, and it is Western price. Yep. Dr. McDougall, JL <laughs> asks, if you do have to formula feed at what age can you take the baby off the formula? Well, you know, I, AJ, it's generally recommended at two years. Uh, the National Institute of Health recommends two years. I think at six months, you should start introducing solid food because the baby develops teeth at six months and can reach out and grab whatever's in your hand. So it's the time to introduce solid foods. It's normal, it's natural. And then by about two years of age, it's kind of time to move on. And it's okay to feed, breastfeed three, four, five years of age. I, I've seen that happen in uh, many, many families and that's their choice, of course, for a whole variety of reasons. But I've also seen babies taken off of the breast and formula at eight months of age. So, I mean, ideally it's breastfeeding for six months strictly and then partially until two years of age. But hey, kids are tough, good grief. They live on Cokes and potato chips. But you know what you forgot to tell them? Hmm. Well, what we did to the denatured cow's milk to make it oh, yeah. palatable. Yeah, part of, the, part of the problem was is the baby didn't like to, to have the the hypoallergenic formula that we were trying to have the baby enjoy. And one of my sons is a chemist, so he noticed this right away. Uh, and that was that the regular formula, regular cow milk based formula contained more sugar than the, than the hypoallergenic formula. And it also costs more, <laughs> the, the kind with sugar in it. 
So uh, what we decided to do rather than pick up all the bad stuff is to just take a little, add a little sugar. So it tells you how much sugar, I think it was like a quarter teaspoon for every two ounces of milk that we added to the formula to get the baby to like it. As soon as we added the sugar, the baby loved it. And then slowly we do reduce the amount of sugar in the formula. And that's how we, we have it. But otherwise they don't like it. Why in the world would they make the make the hypoallergenic formula lower in sugar? Maybe they think the consumer that buys it will be turned off by the amount of sugar in it. Maybe. You know, maybe they maybe they make more money off the cowbell maybe that might be it too. Cowbell <laughs> milk based stuff. And so they're gonna they're gonna price it proportionally. Uh, anyway, that's the way you deal with it. That's in my newsletter. Uh, if you look at hot topics, pregnancy and children, is something about the diet for children in the future. And it's all talked about in there, including all the references. Great. Uh, Dr. McDougall, there's a question on your thoughts on circumcision, whether it should be done and at what age it should be done. Is this from a doctor's point of view or, or, a, or, a, or a male? And I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you, AJ, so you ain't never going to know. Uh, <laughs> well, I, in my I, 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 you know, I have to tell you, it's more of a personal opinion than anything else, is I think you ought to leave nature alone. I don't think any good comes to circumcision. In certain faiths, like, and I'm Jewish, and they just, they whack it off at, I think, nine days. You don't have a choice. Well, you know what? <laughs> Again, you know, I'm sure there are lots of opinions out there and mine, mine is based on, I don't know, whatever. Doesn't make any difference. I just think nature probably did it right the first time. Yeah. You know, I mean, I and mean, think about it also, how when, when we think about the possibility of female circumcision. I mean, if you put it in that context, that being pretty bizarre and pretty, pretty barbaric, doesn't it? Well, why, 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 leave, why don't you leave the little boys alone too? my thought. <laughs> nice. nice. Whatever. Uh, so there, um, there was a clarification being asked from someone here about what, what you said about soy. Joanne said, uh, is, it, is it the estrogen in soy not the same as human estrogen? Are you saying the soy is only detrimental if you want to get pregnant, but otherwise it's okay? Whoa. I don't know that I said any of that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there, there are certain, they're called phytoestrogens. And what they are is they're uh, there are chemicals in plants that have an estrogen effect, but they also have an anti-estrogen effect. They have both a stimulating effect and an anti-estrogen effect. And so they work in very mysterious ways. Uh, I've never heard it said that you should eat soy to get pregnant. I don't think it'll make any difference. And if you found it, I don't know. I can't imagine. Well, I don't think the amount of soy is that amount Unless you, uh, then again, you could, I mean, some people just go crazy over these soy foods. You know, maybe it is an issue. So uh, nice for you to bring that up. Maybe you shouldn't be eating all these soy foods when you're pregnant. Just like the, the, the women in Britain I told you about. You know, may, you know, so maybe you brought up an important point. It, it's not a good thing to eat all these uh, soy products, particularly the isolated soy protein products. You know, the burger, Boca burgers, the soy hot dogs, <clears throat> you don't want to be eating those things. And uh, we, we really don't know the, the absolute answer on this. We do know that Asians who have include a small amount of soy products in their diet are very successful baby makers. You know, they make lots of healthy babies. But they use natural tofu. They do. And miso they, they're and- They're not eating, they're not eating not Boca eating burgers. They're not eating the or, fake, the fake uh, soy foods. Like the hot dogs and the burgers and the yeah. bacon and, and the chicken, to turkey, tofuki. Yeah. You can find anything. I, I think I've seen um, even fish made out of some kind of well, protein. protein. Now it's not. It's, it's not even fish. It's it's a fake. It's fake fish. Oh well. I can't imagine what it would taste like. You know, I, I can't yeah. imagine that you want to go that route. <laughs> Dr. McDougall, someone's asking if you've seen children that were raised on a plant-based lifestyle that got their menstruation beginning at normal ages. Because, you know, little girls I've read as young as six years old are getting their periods. And in the natural world, it's much, much later than that. Well, on, on average, and this is all discussed in a, a book I wrote uh, called The McDougall Program for Women. And chapter five is about uh, menarche and uh, the different things that influence the onset of menarche. 
And what I talk about in that chapter was that the, the latest onset of menarche was in, uh, in Highlander New Guinea girls. And they lived on a diet that was 92% sweet potatoes, sweet potato leaves and roots. And their onset, average onset of their reproductive time was 18 years of age. Uh, most studies of uh, little girls starting their period, which is one measure of reproductive life, you start your bleeding. Uh, it's about 15 to 16 years of age. And uh, little girls in our society, if you look at the onset of bleeding, uh, the onset of bleeding in a little black girl is about eight, uh, about 10 years of age. Uh, she starts getting uh, breast buds and pubic hair at about eight years of age, uh, a black girl in this country. And 3% of black girls in this country get uh, they get pubic hair and breast buds at age three. So, uh, you know, and white, white, little white girls are just a few, few, a few meals behind. You know, they, they come in with their menstrual period started bleeding on age 11 about. Uh, same thing happens in boys. They, they start shaving earlier, you know, about three, four years earlier on the Western diet. And this is all due to what you feed them. And yes, I have seen women who have had their onset of their period when they should. What lots, of, lots of them. In fact, every single one I can think of that raised a vegetarian family. I can think of one couple. This, this, I, I don't even remember their name, but they have like about seven girls. And they all, they all sang this potato oh, song to yeah. me. Remember that? Yeah. Oh, yes. It's Summerfest. I do remember, yeah, Summerfest. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. And all those little girls, I, I, their dad shared with me a little bit about their lives. And they all came into maturation when they should. And that took a lot of worry off of him. I mean, to have seven beautiful little girls out there in the world, that's a lot to worry about for a father. And, uh, you know, it's nice to, to realize that the, the little girls, and I assume the attractiveness towards little girls is not, not powerful until later on in their lives when they're better emotionally and mentally able to handle uh, these kinds of uh, feelings and aggressions. And when they're hard, they're, in some ways they're wonderful, but in other ways they're horrible <laughs> and overpowering. I mean, look at the things that people do in the sake of satisfying their sexual drives. You give that to little children, what the heck? What do you expect but chaos? Anyway. They, uh, well, they, they, well, they, can get, they, can preg they can get pregnant at those ages. So when, when physical maturity precedes emotional maturity, it's not a great thing. I remember there's a prominent plant-based doctor that was bragging that his daughters got their period at 17 and it, it embarrassed their daughters, but it just yeah. shows what can happen when you eat the right food. Well, you know, AJ, in, in our in our life, it kind of went like this. Is uh, <clears throat> My older son was talking to my younger son and he says, uh, he says, uh, I, I know you don't got any hair. I, I didn't have any until much later in life too. And it's because the way mom and dad feed us. <laughs> <laughs> so so don't be embarrassed yeah, when, don't, don't be embarrassed and worry about it because it'll happen when you get, get a little older yeah I believe me it happened in fact he's got two little kids that spent the night last night <laughs> so he matured no, no trouble at all you, you just don't want to force this on little kids in our it's terrible but the things that are happening in our world in our community are overwhelming so I think it's really important for us to to look at our microenvironments, well, what can we do to help our friends and family, and you know, small communities, uh, instead of getting overwhelmed by all the problems of the world? When I do, I just, you know, I throw up my hands. I, I started out this whole thing, you know, about forty-seven years ago, thinking that I was going to change the world. I was going to get all these people interested in what I was doing. Not true. Not true. I don't know that I've made any serious influence. I think I have, but. Certainly, uh, nobody's lining up on my doorstep to get in to see me, except for the telemedicine program. <laughs> they seem to sell out all the time. Uh, our new 12-day uh, uh, sort of live-in program, people come into your home and take well, care they, of Well, uh, they come in by Zoom. Yeah, they come by Zoom. Boy, I tell you, we have really hit a formula there. AJ, uh, folks are losing more weight. They're staying on the program longer than we ever, ever could have imagined. We're doing follow-ups now that are almost a year on these folks. And uh, you know we're getting the kind of weight losses that we only dreamed about in our residential program and the kind of success that we're getting. And I think it's because they're learning it at home. 
while while they're while they're listening to the lectures, they have to fix their own food. They have to figure out what they're going to eat. They don't have to go home and clean out their cupboards. It's already done while they're learning it, and it seems to um, work out much better for people. And um, people are much happier. Those people who took the uh, residential program, which we ran in Santa Rosa, California for 18 years, costing you over $6,000 to come to. Uh, people and have that taken, didn't include airfare. Yeah, that, that wasn't your airfare <laughs> and you know, a lot of other stuff. So maybe 10,000 it costs you to come to. <clears throat> people who have taken both programs, the telemedicine and the residential, unanimously after taking the program and say, this, this is far better. And it costs uh, half to a third as much to attend the program. But so I think the nice thing is, is the follow-up seem to be very yeah, helpful. Yeah. When you've got somebody to look forward to, like Tiffany and Corey every, yeah. every week for a while. Every week, yeah. And then, and then Heather, uh, Mary, and I for a year, at least, a year. in fact, I think it goes on forever. <laughs> <laughs> Our relationship never stops. I mean, have that kind of follow-up has been really, really helpful for people. Anyway, I think the next program is full, but maybe not. Maybe you can get I think into this. I, I'm Heather's watching live. I believe there's just a few more seats and I've been posting the link if people want to register. Well, we, we'd encourage you to do it. If you've been hesitating, don't hesitate. You know, now's the time to get your health back. Um, now's the time to sign up. We're really enthused about the program. Not that we won't be later on, but you know, <laughs> we're really enthused about the results we're getting in people short-term and long-term. And also the, the other thing I really like about the new program, Mary, is I've been able to get back involved with patients. See, I, I feel jealous of Dr. Lim. Dr. Lim gets to see all the people and they pre appreciate that much, much, a lot because he has a much better bedside manner than I have. You can imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> it's much easier to get along with. Uh, a really smart guy too, but I have a chance to see some of the more difficult situations and I really appreciate that. In other words, the old man still has a few tricks that he can throw into a program to make it even better. And, and you're forgetting our, every morning we, um, we have this, what we call a fireside chat. Yeah. So Heather and John and I, every morning for an hour during the 12 days, we have a chance to sit down with the people and they can ask us any kind of questions they want. And uh, very informal, very, yeah, very informal. And it's, um, they like that. So we also have some interesting people that come in who are, who've been successful people in the program yeah. there. But just as so many positive things that we've hit on with this telemedicine program, I just can't tell you how, almost like we, we, we're blessed. You know, and yeah. finally we're figuring out what to do to help you make some changes that we've known for almost a half a century to be essential. And as we started telling you about the program, we talked about pregnancy and our own personal development. It was not easy for us. You know, it, was, it, was not, it took us a couple of years to really change our diet. We were horrible eaters. You know, I would fight you for a pork chop, <laughs> but you know, it took us a while to change and we've learned so much to help you change and to make it easy and permanent. And uh, I, would, I would have to say, if, if we ever do better than this telemedicine program, I'll be surprised. Uh, it couldn't yeah. get better, except for maybe if we have holograms and we could come into their kitchens and <laughs> cooking for them. That, that's what we need to do, Heather. We need to take, we need Push to get- Push a little button and then yeah. the hologram can come up and stand Fix there. Fix your meal, right? Fix your meal or, we, or we teleport your, your dinner to you. Or maybe have Whatever. a camera in their kitchen so if they try to go off plan, you can be telling them, say, hey, wait a minute, don't eat that. Don't yeah. eat that. That's good. I like it. Well, you know, it, it, as, as I've always believed is that intelligent people who really learn the difference, and you don't learn the difference until you follow the program. Do you uh, learn to like the foods, which takes about, mm, about four, five, six, seven days. Till you've experienced a drug drug free living, till you're off your blood pressure pills, your diabetic pills, your heart pills, till you are uh, no longer focused on doctor's appointments and your next surgery, your next test. I mean, this is not a way to spend the few years that we have in life. You know, we've got a lifespan of maybe 85 years. How do you want to spend it? In your doctor's office, worrying about your sicknesses, worrying about whether you're going to take the right pills or the wrong pills whether or not some miracle is going to come out and save you 
what a waste of time. Why don't you spend time, you know, with your hobbies, your sports, your family, your businesses, things you love doing, not get rid of these doctors, get rid of the hospitals. <laughs> and, and believe me, in most cases, and that's the real rewarding thing, AJ, particularly with this follow-up that we've had in the telemedicine program, uh, in most cases, people do, they get out of the system. They get off their drugs. They understand what's going on. They understand the few things that they ought to do for preventative medicine. And, uh, you know, they start enjoying life again. And they like to cook again. They do. Yeah. yeah. You know, but we've heard that so many times from people, haven't we, Mary, how much they enjoy cooking? Well, I'm doing a cooking demo in the next one, and I'm doing a starch lover's pizza. It's made of like oh. potatoes and potatoes and potatoes, and it's going to be amazing. Oh. Sally, who's watching live, oh. says the program is amazing, and I highly recommend it. All right. And Esther saying 77 and off all meds because of you. So lots of fans. You know, Dr. McDougal, we talked about the starting people on a vegan diet when they're young. And, you know, one of the things when, you know, we talked about periods at age a girl gets them, but this diet also makes menopause like practically not even existent. I, I don't know about you, Mary, but I'm 61 and I'm still waiting for what everybody's like talking about. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I have no, my sister and I have been vegan for, you know, 40 plus years. We're like, what, what, you know, I remember my mom used to walk around not with a handkerchief, but like a towel sweating. It's 118 and I'm not sweating. I, I don't even know what menopause is because I, I don't have any symptoms. Oh, that's great. I don't either. Well, you know, this goes along with, with the, the fact that there's no word for hot flash in the Japanese language, or at least there wasn't prior to World War II. So there are many populations of people where uh, the women never go through any suffering. It's a natural, normal occurrence in life. You know, AJ, you may, you, you may uh, uh, like this. I, I don't know whether I've ever told you. I had this lecture I put together about how God hates women. Did I ever give you that lecture about how he hates women? AJ? No, no, no. Okay, well, see, except this gets in, me in trouble. They think that I'm... Uh, that I have gender bias or that I have some, uh, some type of negative attitude about women when I say God hates women, so I stop giving the lecture. But, but you wanna hear it one more time? Okay, God, God, by the reason I think God hates women is because of how poorly they were put together. I mean, they're condemned to being overweight. Uh, more women are overweight than men. They uh, are condemned to iron deficiency anemia, uh, depression, they have high rates of uh, mental and emotional illnesses. They have uh, faulty breasts and uteruses because they're diseased most of their lives and they break down into cancer. Uh, they can't deliver their babies normally. I'm, you know, 30% in the United States have to have them taken out to the top and 70% in Brazil. I mean, God made a horrible mistake when he designed women. What do you think, AJ? <laughs> You see, I stopped giving that lecture because the only other conclusion you could come to is women are do, doing something terrible that causes them to break down into so many areas and not be the ideal half of the species that they could and should be. Did I redeem myself, AJ? <laughs> well, I, they, you know, they say that we're the fair sex, but I think we're actually the strong sex, Dr. McDougall. Well, no if one man, if men had babies, there would be one baby born. <laughs> yeah, well you know it, it, anyway we, we could go a lot of different places on this AJ I think we'll just leave it at the fact that uh, uh, that we're real fortunate that we have two genders you know I viva la difference I, I certainly appreciate that every day all right well it's so it's so great seeing you guys seriously come back anytime lecture or no lecture we just love hanging out with you well, all right you know, I, 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 hope, I hope the folks are, are getting their friends and relatives in line and we're certainly here to help. And uh, do want to again comment on the fact, I, I know AJ, you do this as a community service, but I can see so much happiness in your, in your heart from doing this show. You know, you're, you're so enthused, you're so caring, you did, uh, do a phenomenal job. So keep it up. And, Thank you. Uh, and it's like the pandemic really created a gift for both of us because I'm meeting way more interesting and wonderful people than I would have just doing the same old traveling to right. VegFest to VegFest, yeah. people all over the world. And your program now is global because people that maybe couldn't fly in from Australia or England or Asia, they can do the program now because 
they don't have to travel. And they feel they feel just like they're part of the community. We we introduced uh, some new social interaction sections, uh, which has really enhanced uh, uh, the value of the program because people get to meet the other folks in their group, which are you know not a lot, but just enough people. We have a perfect number that will be attending with you, yeah. and you get to meet with them a couple hours a day and talk about the McDougals and because we don't listen. <laughs> well, people are voting Monday with the McDougal. So if you want to make it a regular feature, I actually told you I had a dream last night that you took over Mondays because I haven't had a day off since March 19th, 2020. So, uh, well, you're lucky, you know, you want to, you want to work hard, AJ. <laughs> no, I do. I do. Happiness I do. comes from hard work, I think. Okay, thank you so much. It's, it's so, it's so great catching up with you guys. All right. Well, thank you folks. I hope you, uh, you spread the message to your, your families, your children, your grandchildren. It's so important. Things are going to be, you know, challenging in the future. You want to have kids that are as uh, as competent as you possibly can for the future that lies ahead for them. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, guys. A last comment was I could listen to the McDougals all day. He is such all a right. great man. Sure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at eleven o'clock today when we start a week dedicated to diabetes, mastering diabetes. And the first guest is Dr. Cyrus Kamplata, who's gonna be talking about the truth about